we have the best caretaker around. Of course, he covered us last season. Hi, Tim. We've got someone here today who's a, a legend of the Toffees, uh, Mr. Alan Stubbs. When I was driving past it, I'm, I'm looking at it thinking, I just hope we're a Premier League club when that stadium is finished. Yeah. It's the blame game, but who's been ever present there? Yeah. Sometimes they need to look at themselves. It might be time. He's not going to be Harry Kane, of course he's not, but he's, uh, he's a very, very good signing because they've made some bad ones. I'll go with him and I'm just happy to hear someone better than that from Stubbsy. Okay, Stubbsy. Ball scores. Yep, check, mate. <laughs> Hey, welcome to another episode of No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill. And I was off last week having a little holiday and Sam is off this week. So we have the best caretaker around. Of course, he covered us last season. We had to invite him back. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Good to be back. So lovely to have you back again. We've missed you. How have you been? No, really good. Had a good break, but I'm ready for the football season again. Obviously, we've had a few games in now. Um, everyone jockeying for position. Um but I'm sure it's going to be a good season as it was last year. Oh, yes. I hope, I hope it's similar to last year, obviously. Well, obviously you nice. do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, we've got someone here today who's a, a legend of the Toffees, uh, Mr. Alan Stubbs, and he hopes it's going to be a better season than last year, but it's not started that way. Hi, Alan. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for joining us oh, today. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's, um, it's always tough being an Everton supporter when you're, when you're here to talk about things. And, yeah, it's, it's been a really difficult start. Um, I've got to be honest, they didn't deserve probably a defeat at Fulham and Wolves on Saturday. They did at, at Villa. But I think everything just highlights the predicament that Everton find themselves in right now. Um, it's like there's a there's a black cloud hanging over Goodison no matter no matter what happens. Um I'm a, I'm here to try and bring a bit of positivity to it. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. Everton fans will appreciate yeah, that I for definite. Yeah, I think they will, definitely, yeah. I'll be interested to hear what you're saying, positive yeah. about them at the yeah, moment, because it's, it's yeah. not great, yeah. is it? No, it's not. It's not. Um, obviously, we've, we've signed a striker that we've been, that our, that our infamous owner has been promising, promising us for 18 months. Um, so, thankfully, we've, we've managed to see that come to fruition. But for me now, it just, it just brings added pressure onto him because everyone will be looking at him now thinking, well, we've got a striker. Uh, that's the end of our problems and obviously it's not yeah. before we get in we'll, we'll go deep into yeah. Everton um, of, of course um, let's find out a little bit more about you okay how is life just now what are you yeah, up to very good um, I've obviously um, had a bit of time out from from my last manager's job which obviously didn't go very well um, and I've just been doing a bit of media a bit of radio I've been doing a little bit of coaching um I'm a head of football at a private school, which is which I'm actually really enjoying, uh, which is great, and I'm and I'm out of the, as we call it, the rat race in terms of the managerial uh, situation. So so yeah, I'm 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 really enjoying it. My handicaps, my golf handicaps, coming <laughs> right down, which which is good. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm very happy right now. So your name's not linked then with is it the Hibs job at the no, minute? No, it's not. No. Um, I'll I'll leave that to someone else. Okay. <laughs> okay. We always like we always yeah, do yeah, like to yeah, check on yeah. this. Yes. I think Neil's put himself forward for it quite a bit in, in the press recently. So um obviously he's been there in the past. Um he knows the club really well. Um but for me, I I I I'd think someone along the lines of Scott Brown, who's doing a good job at Fleetwood, would be obviously started off at Hibs would be a good move for him. Yeah, we had uh, Neil on the yeah. on the podcast as, as well. We do have yeah. a great record of guests then, do, yeah. then getting managerial okay. jobs. Yes, yeah, right. so I ain't worked for well. Be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, since the last time you were on, Tim, obviously we spoke about Harry Kane yeah. towards the end of last season. He's gone now. Um, how are you feeling about that? How did you feel when he went? I think it's a shame for the Premier League to lose one of the best players um, we've seen. Um, I'm sure he'll be back to break Alan Shearer's goal scoring record. I think he's still young enough and fit enough to be able to do that. He's gone to Bayern Munich. He's obviously hit hit the floor running. I mean, no surprise to anyone. Um, they create so many chances. And if you ever want someone in front of goal to put one in the back of the net, it's Harry Kane. So yeah. he's, he's absolutely top draw. Um, was I surprised it was Bayern Munich? Possibly. But then... Having given it a little bit more thought, if it was good enough for Pep Guardiola in, in his prime and as a manager, it's obviously good enough for, for Harry Kane. And I think he will clean up. I think they will win the domestic trophies. Um, whether they can go far and win in the Champions League, 
you know, we'll, hold, we'll watch this space, but I think they've got a good opportunity to. I, I still think they will strengthen in the, in the market. It's interesting. Now, I never really took much interest in German football um, unless it was Champions League, but now I have a keen eye on it, you know, and um, I think he's obviously started brilliantly. There's a lot of leagues to keep an eye on these days of yeah. players, yeah. Premier League players that yeah, have gone, gone around the world. But yeah, I think everybody's going to keep a keen eye on Harry Kane. Um, again, before we get deep into Everton, um, we always like to talk about things that have happened sort of lately and get everyone's opinion on it. Um, you, Your colleague on Sky Sports, Mike Dean, um, had some things to say in the last week or so that I'd love to get both your opinions on. Uh, talking about VAR, when mm. he was um, on VAR last season... He was talking about a dis- he didn't encourage the referee to go to the screen because it was yeah. his friend. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about this? Because obviously it's shook people. Mm. How do you feel about it? I think having spoken to Mike and listened to what he had to say, um, I think what he said wrong was he used the word friend rather than colleague. Um, and I think he admits that. I think he 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 says he hasn't got any friends in the game and i can imagine that having known him for a while now <laughs> i'm only joking <laughs> um no but he's he's uh he said that the choice of word was wrong um and it obviously got highlighted he said it's been out there in the media and it's just been regurgitated really um by the podcast what he did um obviously not going to the the monitor is is was the wrong decision he knew that straight away it I think his real problem was that from the incident, having watched it time and time again, it was it was a clearly a red card decision. Um, got highlighted even more the fact that the corner come in and Harry Kane scores in the, in the injury time. Um, there's a lot of people's livelihoods at stake, not just that game, obviously, but Thomas Tuchel lost his job, you know, on on right. shortly after that, and it's a very emotional game, you know, a game in Chelsea against Tottenham, you know, where they could have got some momentum and confidence from beating the local rivals. So um, I think he's admitted that he got it wrong, um, Mike. He's, and he said many, many times that the buck stops with him. And I think he's he's taken the responsibility. Alan? I think there's so many ramifications from what he said. And and I think what it, all it does is, is it, it opens a can of worms in yeah. terms of there's so many questions now that people will refer back to and think, well, if Mike's done it, who else is doing it? Yeah, and that's that's the problem. And all it does is bring an even bigger spotlight on on the referees and VAR itself. Yeah, and 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 that's that is the problem. So if Mike Dean's come out and said and admitted it, but how many others have done yeah. it and yeah. not admitted it? Yeah, and that's the problem. And 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 realistically, it's that's for me is like you're starting to bring the game into disrepute mm. as a result of that. And some people will call it cheating, you know, and it, it all depends. And and and, it, and as you've just said, the Tim, it's the lang you use the language wrong. Yeah. But for me, it doesn't it doesn't sit well with me, you know. And in terms of a lot of fans, because mm. we all we all look at referees and think there's a bias anyway to to certain clubs, and all this has done now is bring the referees who are under a huge amount of scrutiny right now uh, because let's, let's be honest they're not exactly covering themselves in glory with the decisions that are that are happening week in and week out with, with in the Premier League and I think it's a worrying mm. worrying sign I really do I think for a personality like Mike Dean an experienced referee for someone with lesser experience it's to sit in the VAR and send him to the monitor he knows it was hard for them to do. They knew that he wouldn't like that. And that is the way they're acting at the moment. Oh, yeah. Mm. So when I when I do a game now, I look who the referee is. And I look if there's an inexperienced or more experienced VAR. There's a good yeah. chance the inexperienced referee is going to get sent over yeah. by the experienced VAR. They don't want to be sent and they don't want to send them. So, yeah, he's put it out there now. It is quite clear. But it's something we, we knew anyway. I, they I, I, don't want the game to be re-refereed. Yeah. That's what they don't yeah. want, especially yeah. if they've had a wealth of experience like Mike Dean has had. I had a situation, and this was going back when I was playing at Celtic Rangers, where there was a certain referee there. Uh, he was he was refereeing the Celtic Rangers game, old firm game, and we had a stonewall penalty, which was not given. And the referee, I've gone to the referee, and I'm saying to him, how on earth can you not be given that in 
probably much yeah. um, <laughs> difficult language that you, yes, you, you know, yes. you'd say. And he basically ran past me and went, while I'm refereeing, you'll never get a penalty against Rangers. <gasps> wow. No! Wow. You know, and, and basically, you know, that that's... That's that's obviously at a, at a much higher scale that we're talking about. But, you know, what Mike Dean's done is probably answer a lot of fans' queries in, in, in the past, doesn't it? Well, does this go on? Mm. Well, obviously, we've just seen an example where it does go on. Yeah. You know, and that's the... Beings, that's the they? Yes, yeah. they are. And they are going to make, make mistakes. And I yeah. think we understand that. And I think all it does is now is even open up the discussion now for for us to be able to listen on what them conversations are, has been said. Yeah. Because we realistically now is that I think everybody needs more clarity on exa in, in, on exactly what does go on. Yeah. Definitely. And how they're coming to their decisions. Yeah. Tim, what you said is so spot on, by the way, because I um, had a conversation with a top Premier League referee at an event that we were both at. It was a lovely chat and um, I really enjoyed the conversation. But he said directly to me that he refereed a game in which the person on VAR was a vastly less experienced referee than he was. Mm. And he thought, well, why am I going to why am I listening to you when mm. I'm I'm the one that's been doing this for how many years yeah. and you haven't? So why am I going? Why am I going to listen to you? Yeah, because the experience levels were so different. Yeah, but I, I would say to him because you can watch it fifteen, twenty, hundred times if he wants. We don't care how long it takes. You know, everyone was complaining in the early days. It was like, well, it takes too long to. But I don't care if I'm a manager. I do not care how long it takes as long as we arrive at the correct decision. And I think everyone would say the same mm. in the end. Yeah. You don't like it, of course, and it's not fun for the fans when they're sitting there waiting. And like Stubbsy said can't hear what are they actually talking yeah, about definitely. you know if we can hear it like we did in the women's world yeah. cup i thought it was refreshing yeah yeah definitely and i think again it does like you say it highlights referees are human they have connections with yeah. people and clubs yeah. and yeah. um mm. I, I worry for the game i think we need to do a lot well, i don't think anyone's referees. cheating i don't think in that instance i don't think mike dean cared less whether chelsea or tottenham won the game mm -hmm. I don't think he was influenced by, yeah, he's just trying to help out his mate. Didn't want to send him across because he'd had a tough game of it. I think yeah. he had booked seven players and uh, a lot of lot had gone on and he just wanted um, to give him a quiet time. It was towards the end of the game. But in the end, when Harry Kane equalises, it highlights it when they, when we watch it 10, 15, 100 times. You don't have to. You only got to watch that twice to know that Cucurella's mm. had his head pulled off almost by um, Romero, was it, at the time. Should have been a red card. Should never have been a, uh, a corner. And all of a sudden, um, it's, it's highlighted and we're still talking about it. Yeah, exactly. I do think we need to do more for referees because the game will not exist without them, whether it's, it's mm. training or whatever we need to do for them. Um, I'm guessing then you never had a friend in football and you went easy on them, Alan. Like you were playing against <laughs> them and you didn't tackle them as hard. No, no <laughs> not at all, no. Um, I remember uh, actually, who was it, the referee? Who just, yeah, I think it was Martin Atkinson. who actually gave me a mention in his book. Um, in terms of who was the one of the most um, who was the most fierce fearsome play you've ever come across, I, he actually mentioned me, and I actually thought I was all right with him to be honest. Whenever he made, you know, obviously he made a lot of bad decisions in his time, um, but it's it's emotion. Mm. It, that's all it is, and 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 it's the same for players as well. It is for for referees. Yeah, you know, it's we all, and unfortunately, from from a fan point of view. You're not interested in referees' emotions. You know, you want to see decisions being made for, for your team. Yeah. And, and you have blinkers on as fans. We all have blinkers on. We all want to see the decisions for our team yeah. uh, and the right ones. But, um, but yeah, they need help. I think first and foremost, what people have to remember, they're human beings. They're referees secondly. You know, so when you're talking to, to the man there and you're shouting him like he's, yeah. he's saying yeah. you are all yeah. of the time, if there's a 50-50 one either way, he's not going to give it to you if you've upset him along the way. Mm. So you need to treat him better. I think Ooh. if you speak to the younger players and educate them on this now, you know, be polite to the referee, I think you're going to get more when it comes to the 50-50. Yeah. Let the other players wave their hands and throw the, show dissent. If you're, but it's, hard, it's easier said than done, especially when you're standing in that dugout as a manager. I mean, just lose it. I mean, and, yeah. and then the fourth official is in the referee's ear. I mean, you see him now and Marco Silva, the first three games, he gets a yellow card. He sits in the stand for the yeah. Carabao Cup game last night. You know, it's going to be, they're tough on him. You know, they're, they're really cranking up. Yeah. I think I think it's positive. 
I think this is this this what what we're seeing this season has been a long time coming, and it should have been done a long time before mm. now. You know, you look at you look at the way officials are in rugby and the way the players are. The amount of respect, you know, they they actually put football in in a in a in a poor light when you when you look at the two games yeah. and much respect there is to the officials and 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 I, I think we have crossed the line over the re, over recent years. The amount yeah. of players that have mm. you know ad, ad, approached the referees and and yeah. the way they are you know and this and I, and I think it's right because you're yeah. seeing it at grassroots. Yeah, you are, and oh, and we definitely see yeah. it. Yeah. Not just with the with with the with the young boys and girls, parents as well. Yeah. Oh, it were yeah, a big definitely. thing, yeah. you know. And and I, and I think the Premier League, one of the, I think the the best thing the Premier League have done is bring this in this year. Yeah. Well, the Europa League final was scary, mm. wasn't it? I forget yeah. the name of the referee, but um, the, when he got hounded in the airport by yeah yeah, yes, yeah. You know, was it Jose Mourinho that had uh, was it Andy whipped Taylor? everyone up? Yeah. It might have, yes, because yeah. it was definitely yeah. an, an English it referee. It was yeah, it was Andy, Andy Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. 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 I worry. I have a five-year-old that wants to be a referee, which I also often. Oh yes, I know. Can you believe he's? Five? Got a lot of time he, to change his mind. He grow out of that. Don't worry about it. He just wants to be a ref. Every time his friends play football, he wants to be the referee. So <laughs> yes, just shows you how famous they are now. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And he's more. Do you know what? He watches games and he's more interested in the ref. He's like, how many yellow cards was there? Or if I go, if I go, if I work and I come back and he says, how many? Was there a red yeah. card? Was there a yellow card? Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm. I don't know what that says about him. It's worrying. It's worrying. <laughs> right. We've. Um, We've taken a minute. We've we've delayed. We've yeah. like anticipated the Everton supporters, okay. um, but it is time to sort of de delve deep into Everton yeah. and what is going on. So the only Premier League team that haven't scored a goal yet. Yeah. How are you feeling? Um, you know what? I I would normally say I would. I'm feeling very very worried. Um, but I I, I was looking at. The situation a couple of days ago, and I'm looking at you've got Dwight McNeil injured, who's about to come back. You've got a Wobi, you know, there's question marks whether he's going to be there, but you've got Jack Harrison, who I think is going to be a good signer for Everton. Um, you've got Calvert Lewin, who hopefully is not going to be out long, but there is serious question marks over how long he can stay fit for. And obviously, we've got Beto, who's just recently signed. That's Everton's attacking players in a nutshell there <clears throat> and they're all out injured and that's you know and you, and you look at why Everton aren't scoring goals that is that is a reason they're creating chances they've just not got enough quality in the final third uh, on the pitch right now um, it is it is a worrying sign I, I've, I've got to be honest um, for me what's going on in the background is definitely has an effect on the pitch there's there's too much of there's too much noise in the background. For me, the owner in the summer should have had a clear out. For me, the chief executive went rightly so. The finance officer left. They carried the can. Unfortunately, Graham Sharp left, which I I think he was just guilty by association and he shouldn't have. He's a club legend. Um, but for me, the owner sorry the chairman Bill is is like a He's, he's, he's like a bad smeller that just, just doesn't want to go away. And he's and he's he's hanging on, he's hanging on. This club needs a fresh start. It needs a fresh outlook. We need new impetus in terms of finance. We need fresh ideas. We're stale. Mm. Everton is stale as a football club. Um, and and, it, and it's a difficult job for Sean Dyche. I'd, I, if you ask me now, if it wasn't Sean Dyche, who would, be, who would you say? And I, I'd have to say, I don't know. Because this is a really difficult job for anybody who comes in right now. Mm. So I think Sean Dyche is the right man. Is he the right man for if Everton can try and show a bit of steady progression for the future? I'm not sure. But for right now, mm. I think he's the right man. Who's doing the recruitment there? Kevin Thelwell? Kevin Thelwell has come in. And, and I think he's probably doing the majority of it now. Because, to be honest, there's no one left behind the scenes. Supposedly... The, uh, Bill Kenwright is 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 there to oversee the running of the football club. Um, what exactly that means from 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 Farhad Mashiri, I don't know. The problem is, is Tim, there's, there's a lack of information in terms of from the boardroom, from the director of football, to how this club is is going is running. There's there's a discon there's a disconnect between the fans and the board and the yeah. club. Um, that everyone's not on the same page because. For me, the fans have been 
criticised, scrutinised for doing things that they've not done. Mm. You know, they got accused last season of <clears throat> getting an individual in a headlock, which if that was the case, surely there would have been criminal proceedings yeah. issued. There would have been CCT footage in, in the stadium of this happening, not a shed of it. Mm. And it was labelled at them. And suddenly before you know it, the last thing of Everton's problems is the fans. Yeah. They're the ones that have, 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 yeah. have, have kept them up, basically. Yeah. This so is not the people's club anymore. It's, it? it's, it's certainly, it's, it's the fans' club. But the, I wouldn't necessarily call the people who run the club the people. Yeah. You know, they're... The recruitment has been nothing short of diabolical. They've spent close to 600 million on bang average players. Yeah. Everton are in a worse position now on the pitch than what they were before they spent a penny. Yeah. And that is impossible to do. Yeah. You could bring anybody in off the street, yeah. a working man, and he would probably do a better job than what yeah. the recruitment has done at Everton. And you wonder why Everton are in the position that they're yeah. in now. People need to look in the mirror and look look at it and take responsibility. Yeah. The problem is for me is that no one has took responsibility. It's been a blame game. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been the last head of recruitment. Oh, it's been the last manager. You know, yeah. the people who have appointed them need to take responsibility for yeah. that. Unfortunately, they have. They're the ever present. You got to look at you know Marcel Brands was there. You know, yeah, everyone pointed the finger at him. Yeah. He would be saying that the coaches who you had in place wasn't good enough to yeah. coach the players what he brought into the football club. It's the blame game, but who's been ever present there? Yeah. Sometimes they need to look at themselves. It might be time. Yeah, I think I think it's that time has come and is as has come, but the, they're not going. They you know the chairman has you know has been a a big Everton fan, but he's overseen for twenty one years no success you know mm. so you know surely that that tells you everything you need to know yeah you know if i was if i was in lucky enough to be in that position you've got to look at the big picture take a step back and go you know what am i one of the problems and you would have to say yes mm -hmm. take a step back leave the club become a fan thanks very much someone else's time mm. but for some reason it's not happening what do they do how do they fix it? How do they solve it? Really difficult. I mean, if we look at the glass half full, I mean, we say a new stadium, you know, everyone could be yeah. happy with moving to a, yeah. to a new house. Uh, the fan base will always be there through thick and thin. Yeah. We know what they're like. We haven't played there. Know exactly what they require. I mean, they don't want sophistication. They want someone to roll their sleeves up and leave their everything on the pitch every single game. And I don't think they're getting that. But that's due to recruitment. I think if they give... They need to survive this year. That's, that's all they need to do. I mean, it sounds stupid, but it's a, it's a club like Everton. And we've been saying it for far too many years now. Just need to survive. Just survive. So daishi has got, he's got a tough job, but it's a, it's a very similar job to what he had at Burnley. And he's going to a club which is you know, quadruple in size and probably more. Um, he knows how to recruit, to stay in the division. Now, whether that's to recruit to take the club forward, in the long term, I don't think they can worry about long term. They've got to worry about the short term first. Yeah. So let him, whether you spend one pound or a hundred million pound, let him spend it. Get the right players in, what he feels can fit into the system, how he wants to play to get results in the Premier League. He's proven that he can do it before and I think he'll do it again. And I think with the help from the fans, the fans have kept him up for the last two years and I think they will help him do it again. But Daishi needs some help on the playing side. They need to recruit players. They haven't got long to do it. They need to do it now. I went. I went. Just talking about the stadium. Sorry. To, to no, no, no. I, I was. I went to watch my lad last night play at Wrexham, and the way we, the way I was going, I drove literally right, right past the stadium, and the stadium looks amazing. Mm. You know, but but I'm, I'm thinking to myself, when I was driving past it, I'm, I'm looking at it thinking, I just hope we're a Premier League club when that stadium is finished. Yeah. And and that is that is the big concern for every every Everton fan out there. Um, you know, and and there's only so many times you can keep saying, I hope we stay up this season. Yeah. Because we've been saying that for the last three years and, and we are we are sailing as close to the financial fair play uh, threshold as anybody in the Premier League. You know, you only have to look at our recruitments this season. Ashley Young, free transfer. Jack Harrison, free transfer, loan alone. Um, and we've just only just recently brought in... Um, the two the two signings, 
And I think that is on the strength of that you'll see players getting sold before Friday. You know, I think um, Damari Gray will, will 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 go. There's talk of that being to uh, to one of the Saudi clubs um, to fund what's going on at Everton. It's it is it is an absolute. It's a mess. Yeah, feels like it. And yeah, I completely agree. The idea that Everton can move into a new stadium and not be a Premier League club yeah. is unthinkable. It is unthinkable. It is. Um, they got Sheffield United. Is it ridiculous to say? I mean, we're four games in, Tim. Are we already at the point where it's a must-win game? Yeah, it's a must-win game. It's a must-win game for both of the sides. Um, I, I think it's more than three points. I really do. I think it's momentum. Gives you a little bit of belief, a bit of confidence, take you into the next games. Um, you can't lose that many games on the spin. I think Daishi will try and get them back to the first game of the season. I thought they were very unlucky. Um, Should have won the game. Didn't end up losing it. Um, so I think that they need to just get back to, to where they was then, get their mindset right. What he's good at, and he's used to losing football matches because he's been manager of Burnley, um, and he's he put a little run together. And he tries to keep them as much as noise on the outside. He tries to keep the, the group nice and quiet and, and focused on, on what their job is, and that is to get as many points as they possibly can to stay in the, in the Premier League. And that starts the weekend. I don't think they can lose the football match. Really. This, it's not going to send them down. Of course, there's still a lot of time left. I think it's huge. I think I can't. I can't tell you how big this game is, and and Daishi and that group of players will realise that it's a cup final, um, and and I believe they'll win the game. I really do. I I think more that Sheffield United are not great. Um, I think for all them teams struggling at the bottom of the league uh, this season, and we'd have to put Everton in that scrap. It's one of the easiest seasons to stay in the Premier League because there's two teams in it in Luton. We're, we're, I'm being disrespectful to them. Of course I am. But, they, but Edward's done a brilliant job. There should be no one near the Premier League at the moment. Yeah. He's done, he's, they're beyond their times. I mean, they just move. And I think it's, you know, just recently going into their, their stadium, which, which they refurbished. They should be a championship side, but they're not. But they will be next year. So that's one out of the way. Um and I think Sheffield United will struggle as well. So there's only one spot up for grabs. So it gives everyone a chance. Mm -hmm. And and that is the, the shining light. That's the hope I can give Everton fans out there that you've only got to climb above one other team because two will already be gone. Oh, goodness. That's a shining <laughs> light for Everton right now. Well, it would, they yes. would take it. Yeah. I think yeah. most Everton fans would take I think, that. I think you're spot on with what you just said. Uh, and, I, and I think you're, everything you've just touched on, it, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, I think this is, in terms of, Luton and, and obviously no disrespect for them. They've had a fantastic journey to get to the Premier League, you know. But looking at them and Sheffield United, they're the two I think overwhelming favourites to to go down a season. So therefore, Everton have, have got to be better than one other team. It's that's the simple facts of it. Yeah. And I think they can they can do that. And that's why I think this this is one of the probably they'll probably this is going to be easier for Everton this year. Than what it has for the for the other years in terms of staying in the Premier League. Yeah, yeah. Is that the positive spin we were going to put for everything? This is the, that's the that's positive. Just better, that just got to be better than one team. Listen, I, <laughs> I, I I thought because of where they are, you obviously got you've got Bournemouth through in it. I think that we're going to not going to be in a relegation Kansas, but they're going to be down there. Yeah, and Burnley. Uh, yeah, you know Burnley. You would expect, even though he's done a great job. So therefore, you suddenly think if Everton can be okay, but they need to get points on the board quickly. I think you're looking at sixteenth. Fifteenth yeah. is there to is there to play for? Feels like we'd snatch your hand off. Oh, I'd, I'd, can I can I take that now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're in fifteenth right now. I mean, made yeah. up. Um, so uh, this season on No TV Type of Football, we're asking our listeners if they would like to ask questions. If you would ever like to ask a question, you're very very welcome. Uh, best way to do it is probably just to tweet me. So find me on Twitter, um, and we'll choose some of your questions every single week, as we have been doing. Um, this week we've had a question from Francesco Branco who's asked, is Mikel Antonio the perfect striker for the way that West Ham play and potentially reaching the Champions League? So get your take on Mikel Antonio. I like Mikel. Uh, I really do. I think he's, uh, he gives you everything he's got. Um, sometimes he's not in complete control of what he wants to do. He plays off the cuff. Um, and I think that's very difficult for someone like Stubbs, who would have marked him, to read. Um, he's got pace and power, but he's also clever with his movement. He drags people into positions to make room for, for others. Um, he's hitting things off both feet. I think he's always been a, a continual threat. 
and Stubbsy will tell you better than me being a centre back. He never give you an easy day, even when he's not playing well. You know, because it might not be working for him in front of goal, but he just shake things loose for his teammates. You know, he's a he could he pulls you around. He 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 runs in behind. He's got a whole range of. He's good in the air. I mean, he would be a nightmare for you, yeah, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. And I think is when he doesn't score, he creates. He does a lot of unselfish work for other people. Whether he's bouncing off a, a centre back who miss miss hits his his clearance and it goes into force for someone else. Do I think he's the player that's going to get them a Champions League spot? I don't. I think they're going to need a bit more than that to, to finish in that top four. They need going to need a bit bit more quality. But what David hasn't done, he hasn't brought in a potential replacement for him who is taking them to the next step. And I think he's always had to go back to him mm. because it's like revert back to type yeah, yeah. in terms of the way the way they are. And he's he's effective. Mm. He's a, he's effective. You know he's. He's he's so strong. He's so powerful. Um, he's not going to be prolific. He's not going to score you fifty and twenty goals a season. I think we know that. But what what David likes about him is that he knows what he's going to get from him. And and I think with a manager, when you when you when you know exactly what yeah. a individual is going to give yeah. you, you go, I can handle that. Absolutely. It's the players around him then that yeah. are going to have to create and give yeah. that little bit more of a bit more quality, a bit more guile. Mm. You know. Um, there's no doubt he's he's a player that I don't think any centre back in the Premier League likes playing against. We've talked about on this podcast before about the shortage of kind of out and out strikers that that, yeah. the, that there is around at the minute. Is it true you tried to sign him when you were at Villa? Yeah, I would have liked to have signed him. I think he would have helped to uh, to take us up the league a little bit more. Um, it was never going to be possible. You know, Benteke had left the club, um, so there was an opportunity to to get a like for like. I think he's a little bit more mobile than Christian. You know, he gets in behind. Um, and like Stubbsy said, he's a player who, you know what you're going to get from him. You know, he's a seven, eight out of 10 man. You know, maybe it never a 10, um, but probably never gives you a free. Um, and as a manager, you want to put your head on the pillow knowing you're going to wake up, not be woken up by someone like him. Um, and I don't think he'll give you that. I think he's uh, he's a perfect David Moyes signing. I think you need probably six or seven of these guys in your team and then you can throw in a few Mavics in around them so I think at the time he probably would have been a bit too rich for us um, with with what we were, what we were trying to bring into the club um, and probably a little bit too old at the time and, and having said that he's still playing around now you know I think they were they were looking to to buy younger players very young players and um, he took a took a re real real risk and paid the price unfortunately he was linked with Everton early on in the summer and and I, and I think he would have been perfect for Everton Absolutely. in terms of how they play um, holding up the ball a big striker that, that Sean Dyche wants he would have been and I think he would, if ever, any Everton fans you would have asked what could you um, take anyone now I think Antonio would have been right at the top of the list mm. because we've signed Beto but obviously he's still an unknown we don't necessarily know what we're going to get just yet whereas at least with Antonio you know exactly what you're going to get. What he says in the tin, he yeah. more often than not delivers. Yeah, and he's done it in the league. Yeah, in the league he's coming yeah. to. He's already rehearsed, you know. So you know he's going to hit the floor running. Yeah. Um, the support are going to get behind him because he's the type of player what Everton fans want yeah. to see. Yeah, that was a great question there. Thank you so much to Francesco. You you sent me that on Twitter. Thank you so much. Um, so another player that you'll know very well that we'd like to talk about is Anthony Gordon, of course. So um, mm. cracking start for him. At Newcastle, what have you? What are you thought so far of him? I actually think he's done. He's done better than what I thought um, in terms of going to Newcastle. He's he's got electric pace. I always remember going back to the derby when he was at Everton, and he scared the life out of Trent Alexander Arnold in that game. You know, in terms of Everton, the way they played, they played them on the counter because that really that was the only way they could play against Liverpool. And he had a number of opportunities in that game where. He caused Liverpool big problems, and he's. Um, I think his his start to life at Newcastle was was a bit slow. He's had a you know a couple of run-ins with the manager where he's been left out of the team, and then he started the season. and I think he still needs to add a lot more to his game. Mm -hmm. I think his final product is not where it should be. I think his decision making as well needs to improve. But the one thing that that he does and his is, is pace scares defenders. Um, 
And is he ready for maybe an England cap just yet? I don't think so. I think there's there's a bit more ahead of him just yet. Um, and I think he's got to do a bit more than what he's than what he's done right now. It's got to be the hardest position mm. to get into, isn't it? Unless you're number nine, when there's only one, and that's yeah. Harry Kane. Yeah. And then we're looking at Grealish, we're looking at Foden, yeah. we're looking at Saka, we're looking at Jared Bowen, Still. who's probably ahead, Raheem Sterling, who's yeah. on great form. Yeah. No, he's miles away. Mm. Miles away. And miles away uh, from a call up. Yeah, but he's still young. He's still got opportunities with a good manager who will develop him. Um, so never say never. But at the moment, um, he needs a lot of injuries for him to get a, a call up. Just come back off an under twenty one win and all in the Euro in the European Championships. You know, so I think he was, you know, we keep him there for the time being. Yeah. Let him keep trying to progress. Cause he's I, for me, he's still potential. He's not necessarily proven the way we've just spoke about them players. Who were, who were, you know, they're your, your first names on the sheet when you're thinking about an England team. Yeah. He's not at that stage yet. I'm so, Rashford. Yeah, I'm Rashford as well. Him. Yeah, I mean, they're all ahead of him, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are, yeah. They are. So, yeah, I agree with Sammy's miles away. Cracking <laughs> <laughs> goal against yeah. Liverpool, though. Yeah. I bet you enjoyed no, that. I loved it. You know, it's just a shame he didn't score a few more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what a mad game that was. Um, okay, so we've done Everton. We need to go to Spurs now. Mm. Um, I imagine Spurs fans are feeling a lot happier um, than they were last season. Although, yeah. of course, they got knocked out of the League Cup, which I always think should be on Spurs' radar as an opportunity um, to win something. But what have you thought of Ange so far? I think he's done well. I think he's done well to to get the fans back on side, to give them a brand of football what they they like watching. I mean, over the last three or four years, it's not been nice to watch. Uh, they've suffered it at times because they put runs of, of games together where they've, where they've won. Um, but if they continue winning all of the time, then they will suffer whatever football comes. I mean, don't get me wrong, but if they don't, um, then they'll want to be entertained. And I think he's given them that. And I think by giving them that, um, I think he's there's a lot of players who have come to that football club when I've been very critical of the recruitment, and rightly so, because they've been brought into the football club to work with managers who haven't shone them in the correct light. I think he's doing that. And I think Basuma and, and Saar are perfect examples of that. Basuma was non-existent last year. All of a sudden, Ange has gone in there. He's told him to do what he's good at. He drives with the ball, dribbles through lines. Um, he's all over. He breaks the game up. He's probably put an arm around him. He feels loved again. The fans are back on side of him. So, brilliant. I agree with you 100%. If, if I was going in there as Tottenham manager now, one competition I'll try and win, and I'll try and win it by February, where the final is, is the Carabao Cup. I cannot understand for the life of me why he picked an inferior side last night. They have no thing. Europe. They have no Europe. I know I can understand what the manager is saying and when am I going to get to learn about the rest. We'll get to learn about the rest when the others get injured. Do not interfere with your side that much. He's made eight changes. I wouldn't have made eight changes. I, I think yeah, I think you can make changes, but three or four possibly. Go and win the game. Get Madison, who's very instrumental at the moment, into that side. I think they would have won the game last night. And it's the easiest chance to win a trophy. We're talking about... Talking about how Everton yeah. are in trouble. Yeah. Tottenham are the same boat. They need to win a trophy. And I think that was their best chance. Obviously, it's the best chance. It's the easiest one because teams are making so many changes. But they've got right to make changes because they're in the Europa League. They're in the Champions League. They will make changes and give the op others an opportunity. Tottenham haven't got that privilege this year. All they've got to play for is the league and now the FA Cup. Hopefully, they can... I mean... It's not a trophy to Tottenham fans to finish in the top four. It'd be brilliant mm -hmm. after finishing eighth last season. But overall, on that rant, I'm encouraged by Ange. Mm -hmm. I really am. I think the style of football at least is something which is encouraging to watch and the fans are, are pleased to watch it. Um, and he is um, shining a lot of the players in the correct light. But he got to win. There's a disrespect towards the League Cup that I've never really understood. And perhaps that as, a, as a Manchester City fan, I've seen my team win it so much. Yeah. and always enjoy winning it yeah. and at that point of the season. I think there was a disrespect towards the Conference League last year, the Europa Conference League, until we saw the West Ham fans yes, enjoy definitely. that in the final. All of a sudden, that has put that right on top. People, all, I mean, it changed my mindset of the game. Watching them fans over there, the ex-players, everyone getting involved, the way it was received by the players lifting that trophy on the pitch. I think that has to be the Carabao Cup as well. Definitely. I mean, it's so difficult now with Man City around to win anything. So you might as well win yep. Wasp for up yep. for grabs. I know they're 
um, serial winners of the of the Carabao Cup as well. I mean, they want to win everything. They they take part in. They've got. They can do it because they can change their squad because they've got world class players in every position. And, and Tottenham would argue, well, they had a good enough players to win that game last night. Yes, but there was no fluidity because they haven't been playing together. So I think he got it wrong last night. I think he's missed, missed the trick and all, and I, I, I totally agree with you in terms of everything's been positive about Ange coming into Tottenham right now. The style of play, some of the players, they looked like transformed. And then suddenly now, after last night's results, everyone's going, oh, same old Tottenham. Mm. You know, and suddenly, before you know it, people start to then think, well, the negative then, you know, they're out of the League Cup. What chance have they got now, Silverware? It's only the FA Cup. Whereas it's a, it's a trick missed, and I, yeah. I totally agree. You know, you put your strongest team out. You know, you, you be as strong as you can. Keep the positivity going. And you know, it's like it's the same with 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 winning and losing. It just keeps snowballing. Yeah. You know, and and before you know it, and what it does is says to the players who are not on the team. Yeah. Well, listen, these are doing great at the moment. Yeah. If you want to get in the team, you've got to start lifting your game even more. Yeah. You know, and then when you do get an opportunity. You've got to take it. Yeah. And I, I just I totally agree. Where are they going to play now? Yeah. The players who he's talking about yeah. having yeah. a look at. Where, yeah. Where, yeah. Where, yeah. They're running Can't out. Blame an FA they're running out of games. Yeah. yeah. And it's not going to risk them in the Premier League. It does feel like you just need to play a full team because it, like with South when City got knocked out last year by Southampton, and Southampton had their full mm. team out and City didn't. And Southampton yeah. beat yeah. City. Yeah. Yeah. It just feels like if yeah, yeah, just put your full team and out. And he said that Fulham made six changes. Yeah. But when I was looking at their team, I was looking at Polina in the midfield, I thought, man, they're up for this. Mm. Because for me, he's a reference. He's the top yeah. draw midfield player. So if he's playing, and I, and I just wanted to see Madison up there against them, you know, and, and Basuma yeah. in there possibly. You can bring him off uh, at 45 minutes. You could have been one or two up. Yeah. Instead, you one nil down and you're chasing it. And unfortunately, it was, uh, it was, it was a poor decision. But a really good decision, of course, was James Madison, who is looking like he could be the signing of the summer already, Alan. I think he is. I think he's a, I think he's a really good player. I think if you look at certain players in, in where they are with certain clubs, for me, he's a perfect match for Tottenham with the, the style of play they play, what they've been missing. You know, they've they've missed that that link. It, you know, Son has dropped into there. Now he's he's playing at wide. He's so intelligent, and I and I think I, well, it would have been interesting to see him with Harry Kane if Harry Kane was still there in terms of his assists. You know, but you look at you look at Harry Kane. He liked to drop. Deep a lot of time he had a bit of a free role didn't he yeah. to go and play whatever because he was that good I think James Madison is a top top player I really do I th for me he's the one that's caught my attention in terms of he's the best sign that I think this, this summer's been the, the others obviously you know you look at um, the other ones the, the big ones Casado you know yes he's a very good player but for me Madison sticks out as yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing him this season in a Tottenham shirt. Yeah, yeah it feels like, or, or do you think that the the gap of Harry Kane for the fans, you know, somebody to adore and somebody to put mm. all of their love into, can Madison fill that gap for the Spurs? Well, can. I always, I, well, I said as soon as Harry leaves the, the club, if you're a young kid, Tottenham fan, who are you going to put on the back of your shirt? I think that's the answer. Yeah. I think Madison is going to, must have spent a few more quid because Kane was quite a short name. Um, but I think <laughs> the that club will like that then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I think he's he's someone the kids can look up to. He, he's a, he's got good technique. You know, he, he plays the game. Well, people want to be entertained. Um, I think he's a Tottenham player. I think he's got that swagger about him as well. He just needs to be more consistent. Um, it's all right doing it for the first month of the season. He needs to do it through the winter months as well. When the team has a dip in form, he needs to be the one who drags them through it. Um, like Harry Kane did. Um, he's not going to be Harry Kane. Of course he's not. But he's uh, he's a very, very good signing because they've made some bad ones recently um, in recent seasons. And Basuma, for me, he's is, is been outstanding as well. I think he's relished the fact that Postacoglu Pos wants to play on the front foot. Um, and I'm really pleased with, with them too this season. Yeah, I, I think it's been good. For me, the, the signing of the season will eventually be Declan Rice. Okay. I, I really believe that. I think he's he's the player what Arsenal needed. Um, I'm just absolutely amazed that Man United went out and never come and signed him and Harry Kane. And then for me, they would have challenged for the Premier League. Um, but they've gone backwards. 
yeah, I think that was baffling for everybody about what well, was going on It's there, just yeah. not there anymore now, are they? I mean, they're not in that market. But yeah. Years and years ago, when we were certainly yeah. playing, they used to, if they looked at a player at Everton or looked at one at Tottenham, they'd done it for Tottenham many, many years. Man United would say, he's coming to us. And that's what happened. It doesn't happen anymore. So yeah. them... You know, them days, are, them days like, are gone. Yeah. Violence seems like a weird signing. risk. It's still yeah. a risk. I mean, a young player, he needs to develop. He's never played in the Premier League. 75 million, you know, it's not out of the way. I mean, we're talking about another 25 million for Harry Kane when you're guaranteed, you know, 25, 30 goals a season. But they're just not in that market anymore. I'm really glad they didn't sign him. Yeah. City, <laughs> City are really the new, new United, aren't they? Yeah. Because whenever anyone's linked with Man City, they done. go. Yeah. It's done. Whereas with United now, you know, you look at their, their targets and it's, well, he's linked with him. Is he going to get him? You know, United have, have certainly fell down the pecking order. They're still obviously a huge club, but they're not in terms of nailed on as soon as they're linked with a player now that they're going to Man United. Yeah. It's just it's just the way it is. It's 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 where United are right now. Absolutely. Which you'll be happy to. Very happy about. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to be nice yeah, and like yeah, a little impartial yeah. there, yeah. but inside I was very thinking... Very professional yes. face on there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Right, we're going to do something a bit different today. I'm going to ask you together to build an ultimate Premier League player. So I'm going to give you a few characteristics. I want you to think about who would be the ultimate player for that. And we'll put them together and we'll make our ultimate Premier League player. So we're going to start with the best right foot. Who'd be the best right foot in your ultimate Premier League player? For me, this player is Kevin De Bruyne. And I think he can do whatever he wants to do with his right foot. Open tins. Paint. <laughs> I think he's got, I think he's got one foot, just and that's yeah. his left foot, and I think he's got three hands. He can do so much with his right foot. Um, I think he has to have the best right foot in in the Premier League, but um, it will be it will be close with some with some ex players who who are very very good as well. Um, but for me, I, I think it's difficult to find a better one in the inside the foot, outside the foot. He pings things. He can he can. Lob the ball. I mean, he's backspin. I mean, surely there's not not much more you can do. I, I was enjoying Manchester City Twitter this week as well. Um, every year, City fans mm. around this time of year bring this out again. There was when we signed Kevin De Bruyne. There was one of the national red tops did an entire back page that said they were, they were basically signing Kevin De Bruyne off. The headline was sixty million pound flop. And every year around this, when the <laughs> signing anniversary <laughs> comes up, City fans bring yeah. it back out on Twitter just to. Remind them that they were very wrong. Okay, Kevin De Bruyne, right foot. You happy with that? I think so. I think the only one, the only one I would possibly even think about, and this doesn't sit very comfortable with me at all, would probably be <gasps> Steven Gerrard. Okay. Yeah, good. That shot. must be tough for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good no. shout. I just think Kevin's got a little bit more guile. Yes. I think Steven have more power yeah. in it, but yeah. um, I think he can. Wherever the ball's situated, I think Kevin just makes it work. Right, so we'll take Kevin's right. Mm -hmm. Who's left are we taking? Oh. <laughs> Interesting one. Got you thinking, I like yeah, I've this. Got you thinking there. <laughs> I, I've, I actually played with with one, and, and there's going to be, foot, but Leighton Baines had an unbelievable left foot. Yeah. You know, in terms of assists that we've seen, he was up there in terms of all time assists for that position. Yeah. Um, probably. Should have played at a this is a sit around at a bigger club as well. You know he was good enough to you know he was linked with Man United at one time and he it didn't happen. Um, but Leighton Baines had had some left foot. Mm. I when I was thinking about left foot, I was thinking left backs. I think Luke Shaw has got a good range of passing with his left foot. Yeah. I, I just think someone who's done dribbling with the ball and passable into the net and, and striking it surely has to be Mo Salah. Oh, okay. I mean, someone who's, I'm not sure it's the most cultured left foot, but he's, he's achieved so much with it. So, I would, I would probably say Mo. I'll have to go back to Alan and see how comfortable he is putting a Liverpool player in Definitely our ultimate Bainsey. player. <laughs> Bainsey. Do you know what? I'm going to go Bainsey. <laughs> um, speed. Whose speed are we taking? Ooh, Thierry Henry. Oh, nice. Yes, I like that one. Okay. Move on. Okay, we'll take that. There we go. I have to concede like, that. Yes, concede that. Yeah. I mean, I would throw yeah. Kyle Walker in there, but I'll take, yeah, I'll take oh, Thierry Henry. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah. 
Football That's IQ. That's a good race. Yeah, it is a good race, by the yeah. way, yeah. Football IQ. Can't use De Bruyne again, can I? I mean, he's got to be up there. I'm one of the brightest footballers, you know, he plays with his brain. He's, he's, the, he's the manager's reference on the pitch. Whatever Pep tells him in training, you know full well that he's understood it and is trying to implement it to the rest of his teammates when he's out there. I'll go with him and I'm just happy to hear someone better than that from Stubbsy. Okay, so four scores. Yep, check, mate. <laughs> I think we've got to get a red shirt in there. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to give okay. it to Scalzi. Scalzi, okay. Scalzi was a immense footballer. Okay, I'll give you that. You're not happy? No. Oh, Kevin's already in it, so I'm fine. Oh, well, I don't yeah. want people to say I'm biased. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm not biased. Got to have a bit a of lot. impartiality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one again. <laughs> okay. And then aerial ability. Ooh, that is a good one. We really got them thinking. I've, I like I've, this. I've, I've got mine. I'm okay. just staying okay. quiet. I'm waiting for. A, okay. I've got. Drogba was very good in here. Um, he was probably one of the one of the best. Actually, I played with one and all. Duncan Ferguson was very good in here as well. I know. Uh, who wouldn't have enjoyed playing against? I would possibly go Drogba just now. I will, I'll give you two. We have a little think about them. Les Ferdinand. Yeah, fantastic. Actually, yeah. Okay. Alan Shearer. Okay. I'd I'd have to maybe just in terms of Alan Shearer's goal score, but in terms of aerial power, Les Ferdinand was unbelievable. Yeah. A leap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it. So we've got Kevin De Bruyne's right foot. We've got Leighton Baines' left foot. Not Salah controversial uh, we're going for the speed of Thierry Henry the IQ of Paul Scholes and the aerial ability of Les Ferdinand mm -hmm. that was pretty decent be a few yeah. quid that yeah, so yeah. Is, uh, it, is that how much the Saudis would pay for that no it's in, even it's, I think it's too expensive <laughs> even for them <laughs> love that okay we're at the point of the podcast Alan where we do quick fire questions although okay. again it's um, never quick never quick every week it's never quick right another question come from one of you guys our wonderful listeners thank you so much you can tweet me your questions every week and, and I'll ask the guys and it's come from Darren Harmon and I love this question by the way who is currently the best centre back in the Premier League he thinks Van Dijk has had a tough 12 or ish mm. or more months now best centre back in the Premier League I still think he's the best and we have seen a few errors creep into his game, but I still think he is the best. Um, you've got a few uh, Saldiva, who's up and coming, young, um, done very well, but I still don't think there's anybody that's mm. getting close to him. You know, um, no, I don't. I still think he's head and shoulders above anybody. I think he was way out there on his own before the injury. I think we haven't seen the best of him, but we haven't seen the best of Liverpool uh, as well, which makes a difference. It, it helps when you're a mid, when you're a, a centre back, when you've got a midfield who had the energy of that midfield what won the Premier League for Liverpool. You know, because they're, they're getting the opposition's head down. It's a lot more predictable to read the play. I mean, he's just a Rolls Royce of a footballer. He gets there, he can play. Um, I'd put Ruben Diaz in there because I like leadership qualities. I think. For a team with a manager who wants to play a certain way, when he feels that it's right to boot it and get it into the stand, he absolutely does it. And then he'll take the consequences if the manager's not happy with it after. I think he's a leader on the pitch. I think he galvanises others. So I'll put Diaz in there, but I would be happy if we want to stick Virgil in there as the uh, as the main man, you know. Okay. Will Sean Dyche be the Everton manager by Christmas? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yes, 100% should be, but, you know, they've done a lot crazier things than that at Everton. So, I will not hold my breath, but <laughs> yeah. for sure he has to yeah. be, doesn't he? Yeah. He's got to be. There's, there's, Sean Dyche is not Everton's problem. Yeah. And I think that's what you've, you've got to... They've got, they've got to give as much help as they can to Sean Dyche, uh, this board, uh, which is is not easy, is easier said than done. Sorry. Um Sean Dyche is the right fit for Everton right now. Um, if I'm talking to the Everton board, leave him alone. Just help him. That's all I would say to him. Let him let him do what he's got to do with his team. Um, I actually do think Everton will be okay this year. Uh, Everton's problems are off the pitch, mainly, not necessarily on the pitch. Okay, we say yes. Sean Dyche will be Everton manager by Christmas. Will Spurs finish higher than eighth in the Premier League this season? Well, you'd hope so. 
Um, I think he'd be there or thereabouts. I think um, obviously with the less games, no no interference with international. Uh, sorry, um, European foot fixtures. No Carabao Cup. <laughs> I mean, they've got to concentrate on that. And when the FA Cup comes around in January, surely they've got to finish in the top eight. You would have thought. Um, to finish in Europa League next season will be a bonus on the, on the back of eighth last season. So, yeah, I think I'm encouraged the way the manager wants to play, um, and they need to uh, they need to finish in, in in the top eight. I would suggest. I definitely agree. I think they'll I think they'll comfortably finish top eight. Uh, I think Ange will do and carry carry on the start that he's had to this season. I think Ange, in terms of the style of football. Uh, is a real good fit with Tottenham. Um, I think I hope Daniel Levy backs him, um, and, and I'm pretty sure that there might be in terms of the lead up to Friday's window um, that it's going to be an interesting few days for for Spurs. I can see some 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 additions coming in, maybe some going out, but um, I think this could be an exciting season for for, for Tottenham. Great. Uh, another quick fire one for you: Who wins the Premiership? Rangers or Celtic? Ooh. Celtic. I still think I said, they haven't. You know, obviously, had a disappointing result last weekend at home to St Johnston, but I still think Celtic have got far too much for Rangers. Um, I think Rangers um, will definitely be stronger. They've had a they've had a, a big turnaround in terms of recruitment. I think they've brought in some somewhere in the region of 10, 11 players this this summer, which is which is a, a huge transformation. And there's a lot of pressure on Michael Beale now as a result of that because I think in the past it there's been an overlap of of Steven Gerrard's team and, and and previous whereas I think now this is Michael Beale's team and I can see Brendan coming out um, over the course of the season comfortably in the end. How many points? Twelve. Oh, <gasps> wow! Celtic Sel- like to win the league by twelve points. Yeah, yeah. They should have won it by by. F- by 15 plus last season so I think Celtic will have a strong window come the end of this week and I can still say big big old firm game at the weekend which is going to be Rangers have got a big game um, this week in, in for the Champions League qualifier which I think is going to be a tough game against PSV um, this is a huge week for Michael Beale Really best of luck to Rangers. We'd love to see them get into the Champions League group stage. It's going to be a tough one. Um, Celtic or Rangers? A Celtic for me, yeah. Okay. If I think the players, I mean, Brendan's a very good manager and I think the players are too good. Okay. Two questions left. Okay. Um, obviously, you played under David Moyes at Everton. Um, any memorable stories that you can <laughs> share with us? Yeah, there's, there's a few. I actually remember when we, we qualified for Champions League uh, back in 2004 and we'd, we'd qualified on a Sunday. The results went our way, so we thought, so we couldn't be, be caught. And David's brought us all out to the, to, to the Albert Dock and let's, we're going to celebrate. So we had a few drinks there and off we went on our, on our night out with the players. Quite a few of us stayed out. We had a bit of a late one. Uh, we were off on the Monday and we were travelling down to Arsenal on a Tuesday. So we, we've travelled down and David on the Sunday night has gone to us, right, go and enjoy yourselves. Fantastic, fa- fantastic achievement. Well done. Um, don't worry about the Arsenal result during the week. We, we've achieved what we wanted to achieve. So anyway, night out, gone down on a Tuesday, got to the game, named the team. So we dressed a few players. I was on the bench with Duncan and a, and a, and a couple of others. And the next minute... Um, 1-0 Arsenal, 2-0 Arsenal, 3-0 Arsenal, 4-0 Arsenal. Come in and the next minute, half time, the gap has given us a is given us a right um talking to. Um go back out and then 5-0 Arsenal, 6 0 and I'm looking at Duncan, Dunk's looking at me, and I said mm-hmm. to Dunk, I said, get yourself ready, you're going on here. <laughs> And Duncan, in no uncertain terms, has told me where to go. And I've gone, seriously, you're going on. I said, I'm not going on. I said, he's not going to put a defender on a 6 0. So when Dunk's like, and so the next minute, the gaffer's turned down, I looked at the bench, and me and Dunk have just slipped in our seats and sliding, <laughs> sliding down. And Dunk's, Dunk's like, he's gone to Dunk, Dunk, go and get warmed up. And Dunk's gone to, gone to David. You are having a 
and he's gone. He's just he's just get dunked the stair and gone. No, I'm not. Get yourself warmed up now. So Dunks like took five minutes to get his boots on. Another five minutes to walk down the touchline, and then he's given the nod, and Dunks run him well, <laughs> jogging back to to the, to the gaffer, shaking his head at him as if to say, "What on earth are you doing?" Uh, and that was that was um, it wasn't a good night. And then we've gone in after the game. The gaffer's talking to everybody. That's a disgrace. It's humiliating. I think it was seven one. We got beat. Ooh. And um, and the gaffer's looking around, and everyone's got their heads down because no one wants to stand up because he knows he's going to go straight in now. And I mistakenly have put my head up and looked at the gaffer, and he's gone. And I was the captain at the time, and he's gone. Um, Stubbsy, what what are you saying? And I went, well, well, Gaffer, you said on Sunday, to be fair to the lads, <laughs> have a good night and don't worry about the Arsenal game. You know, we've achieved what we wanted to achieve. And you can see the steam coming out of his ears and he's gone, well, that was effing Sunday. This is Wednesday now. Um, so You're a, a brave man. I was. I was maybe stupid. <laughs> brave or stupid, whatever you want to call it. But um, he was all right after that. I think it was just obviously he didn't think that was going to happen. But... Mm. we'd achieved you know something you know what we'd all set out for that season and, and everyone everyone had written us off and all as as not a chance of doing it so so yeah that was just that was warm well it, it leads me lovely into the last question of the day as well so Everton achieved what they wanted to that season will they achieve what they want to this season and we're calling it staying up yes I I, I do think they'll stay up I don't think it's going to be tough it's going to be a tough watching all the times um it's it's not easy being an Everton fan going to watch it. I must admit, um, and sometimes the football is 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 not what we want to see. But but right now, I think Sean Dyche will will play the style of football which he thinks will give Everton the best chance of staying up. Um, and and I and I can't I can't knock that. So answer to that is yes, I do think Everton will stay up. Okay. Tim, I think they'll stay up um, by default. I think that Burn, um, Sheffield United will go down, uh, Luton will go down, so they've got to go above one other. Um, and I think they, because of their fan base, I think they'll get above even Nottingham Forest, Wolves, or Burnley. So I think they're in a dogfight with with them three teams. Um, I think they'll be above Sheffield United and Luton. So yes, I think they will stay up, and I hope they do. Thank you. Pleasure. Alan, thank you so much thank for joining you. us today. Pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks uh, for jumping in again. Pleasure. Thank Always. you. We're going to see you soon, I think, as well. I think Sam's taking a little holiday in a couple of weeks. So yeah. we'll see you again very soon. Uh, international break next week, which means we are not here, which is tied really nicely in because my brother's getting married oh, next well, week. So you? that's oh, tied okay. nicely into that. Yes, I'm heading up to Scotland for a good old Scottish wedding. Sorry about very that. Much. <gasps> it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> what are you on about? Hopefully the weather's nice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's probably going to be absolutely freezing. <laughs> it's going to be freezing, but it's going to be wonderful. So we will be back with you in two weeks. We think it'll be Tim. If it's not Tim, it'll be Sam. If it's not Sam, it'll be Tim. But we'll definitely be here and we'll be here and I will be here. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill. 